Uh, good morning, everyone. If you're here for the Wisconsin Land and Water Annual Conference, you're in the right spot. So congratulations. Um, my name is Matt Kruger. I'm the Executive Director of Wisconsin Land and Water. And on behalf of the entire Board of Directors and the staff of Wisconsin Land and Water, I want to welcome you to our annual conference. Um, I get the honor of starting off our conference and running through some introductory announcements before we start with our keynote this morning. Um, I'll say from the beginning here, we, we planned on and hoped to be in person for this event, uh, but two months ago when things were looking pretty grim with the Omicron variant, uh, we made the difficult, but I think the right decision to go virtual with this conference as we felt that being in person would unnecessarily put too many people at risk. Um, so while we know that Zoom fatigue is real, uh, we're overjoyed that more than 300 of you um, saw enough value in what we were presenting today um, to come and register for our conference. So we're excited to, to feature um, some of those, uh, those sessions over the next couple of days and, and to interact with you all. Um, before getting started, I wanted to just cover some, um, some Zoom tips, though I'm sure everybody's an expert at, uh, at Zoom and virtual meetings at this point. Um, there is a slide, I don't know if Christina, if you can pop that slide up, but um, the menu bar on the bottom of the Zoom screen is your friend. Um, there, it has the mute button, the camera, participant list, uh, and the chat box, and also reactions. So you can give uh, thumbs up or applause or whatever you want to give throughout the, um, throughout the time, uh, throughout the presentations. I guess just to test how savvy everybody is out there. Um, and whether you can hear me, why don't you try to give a thumbs up or some other sort of uh, reaction over the next 15, 20 seconds, and we can just make sure that people are, are interacting uh, okay there. Um, for the purposes of knowing who everybody is, we ask that you rename yourself um, with, your, with your name and your organization, if possible. It helps us know who you are. This is particularly helpful during Q&A. You do that by hovering over your, your name and clicking on the three dots in the upper right hand corner and choosing rename yourself. Um, we ask that people feel free to turn their cameras on during the Q and A's so we know who's asking questions. That's helpful, um, but obviously not necessary. Um, and if you, have any, if you have any need for assistance, you can click on the participant list and you can find a Wisconsin Land and Water staff person um, who will have Wisconsin Land and Water in their name and you can send them a chat or you can contact Kristen Teston or Christina Anderson directly, um, whose contact info can be found in the conference program. Uh, one important announcement is that all of our conference sessions will be on this same Zoom link. So um, you would have gotten this link, you're obviously here, but make sure you hold on to this link. This will be where, uh, where all the action is taking place. I wanted to take a minute to thank our sponsors who have generously supported this conference, including our gold sponsor, uh, USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, we have silver sponsors, the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection, or DACAP, and the Michael Fields Agricultural Institute, and the Pete and Well and Castle Rock Stewards. Um, additionally, we have a host of other bronze and nonprofit sponsors, and we're grateful for all of their uh, generous support. So please check out their profiles in our conference program. Um, our conference hub, as Christina mentioned a few minutes ago, um, is really your one-stop shop for all things related to the conference. So it features the conference program, the day-to-day -day session guides, and the hub will be updated uh, daily to feature news and announcements for the day. So our, um, our conservation award winners will be announced via the conference program that appears in the conference hub later today. Um, winners of our youth education conservation awareness poster and speaking contest can also be viewed in the conference hub. So you can see the actual winning artwork and you can watch the winning speeches. And this is always a highlight of our conference for anybody who's ever attended our in-person conference. Though it isn't occurring in the flesh this year, uh, we're very happy to be able to continue this important part of our event uh, through this virtual format. And also in the conference hub, you'll find our online silent auction. Um, all proceeds from this silent auction go directly to our youth education programs. So please bid generously and bid often. Um, there's some great stuff in, in there, um, including some really unique barn quilt art to some great fishing packages to barbecue kits and much, much more. So there's, um, there's a lot of good stuff there. The auction is open until noon on Friday. Uh, we're also hosting a virtual networking room, which we just had a nice morning coffee session in, um, similar to last year's conference, where 
it's open. The room is open at all times. It's on a different link, um, but it's open all times during the conference. So if you want to connect with another attendee, um, you can plan to meet them over in the networking room and you can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation or you can have group conversations. Um, so the link for that can be found in the conference program and we'll see if we can also get it put into the chat. Um, the State of Wisconsin Land and Water Conservation Board is a body that advises the Department of Ag, Trade, and Consumer Protection on soil and water conservation issues and farmland preservation issues. And Wisconsin Land and Water members have the honor of electing three representatives to this board, which gives our organization a really important voice in conservation issues. So we have six candidates that are vying for these three seats. And at 1230 today, um, they'll be briefly addressing our group and outlining their qualifications for, the, for this board. And their bios may be seen in the conference program. Um, each Wisconsin Land and Water member county may submit votes for the candidates of their choice. And all ballots are due to Chris Schlute by 8 a.m. this Friday. And then our new Land and Water Conservation Board reps will be announced during the annual business meeting on Friday afternoon, which begins at 2.15. Uh, just a couple more announcements. I, I do want to take a minute and recognize the efforts of the Wisconsin Land and Water staff team in the excellent work that's been done to put this conference together, um, especially on short notice after we made the decision to pivot to a virtual format. Um, I want to give special recognition to Chris Schlute, who rose to the challenge of transforming an in-person event um, into the one you see today in a very short period of time. She was our spiritual leader, um, and she did a great job and continues to. Um, and to Kristen Teston for her creativity and hard work in supporting all aspects of communications around the conference, including using our shiny new website to build out a conference hub and a really cool conference program. Um, and I also want to give a nod to Kim Orkentine for helping navigate the logistics and administration of doing all of this in a very short uh, period of time and busy time. So um, staff have done a great job. Committees have also done a fantastic job. Our committees are really active. Our professional improvement committee and our technical committees they have their fingerprints all over the conference and determining what sessions uh, are, are really the most important ones to hear um, and helping to organize that. So I appreciate their work, as well as our Youth Education Committee, who stepped up in a really big way to support these virtual uh, events, uh, youth ed events virtually, um, including the silent auction. So as always, this is really a team effort and there's numerous people behind the scenes who have worked to make this a reality. So um, kudos to uh, all the folks involved with that. And then um, lastly, on the staffing front updates, I wanted to introduce our newest staff member, Michael Hook, who's um, our, he's our newest employee clocking in at about one month on the job. Um, Michael is our statewide training coordinator and he'll be leading our state interagency training committee and helping him develop and helping our state develop a core conservation curriculum for conservation staff. So uh, if you see Michael, be sure to say hi to him and welcome him to the Wisconsin conservation world. Um, so I don't want to prolong uh, further kicking off our, our conference and, and hearing from our keynote speaker, Jay Fear, anymore, who I know many people are excited to hear from. But I also have to say something beyond just logistical and housekeeping announcements. So um, I, I wanted to say that Wisconsin Land and Water, we're always attempting to pull together a top-notch conference. And that usually features not any particular theme necessarily, but touches on numerous conservation topics relevant to the particular moment of the conference and to our county conservation membership and partners in general. And of course, in the conservation world, that's a broad suite of different topic areas. So for this conference, the topic areas include soil health, forest management, climate resiliency, floodplain and hydrologic restoration, uh, invasive species management, groundwater protection, and, and much, much more. Um, if there was a theme that runs through these sessions, I would suggest it would be adaptation, as the work of conservation is never done, and there's always challenges that force us to continually assess and monitor and revise our approach. And this has always been the case with conservation work, as the factors that, the, the factors that influence what we see on the land are many. There's economic, social, cultural, political, regulatory, environmental, governmental, there's, there's so many of them, to, um, just to name a, a few of them. And increasingly, these are global factors outside of our direct control. So this is certainly the case from an economic perspective and a market perspective, but perhaps even more significantly from a climactic perspective. And these local impacts that we're feeling from global climate changes are increasing 
and will only continue to increase in the future. And while we can't affect what happens on the other side of the world, we can certainly acknowledge and adapt to what's happening here in Wisconsin. And according to the most recent report from the Wisconsin in Initiative on Climate Change Impacts, or WIKI, who we're gonna hear from later in the conference, um, quite a bit is happening here in Wisconsin. Specifically, we're getting wetter. We're averaging seven more inches of annual precipitation than we did in 1950, with this last decade being the wettest on record. And we're getting warmer with the average daily temperatures increasing three degrees since the 1950s. So among other impacts, we're seeing increases in extreme weather events, which will continue to increase in the future. So really now more than ever, it's our responsibility as conservationists to continue to adapt our approach and to address these new realities. Um, there's a wealth of information that we're gonna take in over the next several days, all of which is gonna help us continue to adapt and to learn how to be resilient in this new reality. And it's gonna take all of us working in concert toward that end, toward a more resilient Wisconsin, which is one more reason why we're so grateful that so many of our partners and friends have joined us for these important conversations at our conference. So with that, I would like to introduce Wisconsin Land and Water Board President um, and Monroe County Conservationist, Bob McKeel, who's been immersed in resilience conversations and adaptations over the past several years. You're gonna hear more from Bob later in the conference. Um, but first, Bob gets the honor of introducing our keynote speaker this morning. So Bob, if you're ready, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Matt, and uh, good morning to everyone. So before we um, start, quick note, um, our keynote session was made possible today thanks to the generous support from our conservation partners, the Natural Resource Conservation Service. So I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker today, who I was fortunate enough to virtually meet and host last year at one of our Monroe County Climate Change Task Force meetings. And that's all thanks to my LCC supervisor, uh, Ron Lethe. Ron and his late wife had a working relationship, relationship with Jay back in their NRCS days in North Dakota. As Ron stated, what is so powerful about Jay's work and that of Minokan Farm is that the practices they promote are scalable to any size farming operation. He has proven that you can reduce your chemical fertilizer applications, reduce erosion, improve soil health and water quality, and still be profitable. Jay's conservation ethic is drawn from his parents and grandparents, farming through the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. This propelled him into the conservation world by studying at North Dakota State and working for NRCS from 1980 to 2020. He started out as a conservationist working across the state of North Dakota and finally becoming the district conservationist, who always enjoyed um, that portion of work, working with farmers off the end gate of a pickup, selling conservation. The last stage of his career, he accepted a new position as the NRCS soil health expert. As the soil health expert, he traveled to a different state, province, or country every week over the course of six years. He only had one requirement when traveling, that he stay with a farmer. As you listen today, you will find someone of great knowledge, passionate about his purpose, while staying grounded as the soil he advocates for. Please welcome the lead educator from Minokan Farms, Jay Fear. Thank you. I, I don't think I can live up to that, Bob. So maybe you want to introduce me again. I don't... <laughs> we'll take we'll take a swing at the ball. So can you hear me? Coming through okay? Yep, All we right. can hear you. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to uh, see if I can share a screen with you. Okay, can you see uh, can you see a slide? Yep, we're good. Okay, I think we're in business. Well, good morning, everyone, and um, thank you, Bob, for that introduction. It, um, it's a little overwhelming for me, but um, I do want to share some things with you. Um, I first of all want to give a shout out uh, to the Wisconsin Land and Water for your conference. Uh, these haven't been easy times to have a conference. I think it's been a bit challenging. And, and so kudos to you for, 
for pulling it off. And uh, a lot of our events recently have been um, kind of hybrids, um, you know, so we, we're kind of prepared to go either way or offer, um, offer choices uh, for people. And so I, I think the fact that you are able to do this uh, speaks well of your organization. So thank you for that. So what we're gonna talk about first uh, this morning is fostering life. And when you think about that, um, it, it a little more describes the second half of uh, my career. It certainly doesn't describe the first half of my career. And so it's, um, it's a work in progress many times, but I also firmly believe it's our way forward when we look at everything from food security to cropping systems to nutrition, uh, all these things that are so important. So this, this first photo is just of the Minokan farm. We are harvesting yellow field pea, food grade. And um, it was a, one of those beautiful evenings. And my wife took this picture. Kind of makes you remember why, why you chose the career you did. And so that was, that's just, that's the Minokan farm right there, which uh, any of you and all of you are welcome to visit whenever you would like. So I want you to think about this talk today uh, that the planet is your farm. So this is your farm and you have some issues, if you will, or challenges, if you will. So if you live below the equator, uh, you're, you're a real minority in population. So about 10% of our population lives south of the equator about 90% north. So you can already see where you got some issues and challenges for distribution of food. And then because we're only 29% approximately land mass, not all of that is going to be farmed. Uh, some is mountains, deserts, um, frozen, uh, all, the, all these challenges, if you will. So the actual land mass that your farm uh, actually produces grain on is fairly small. And so you think about all these challenges today and, and uh, I think that overview kind of puts us in the right frame of mind for this particular talk. So I wanna start out with Leopold and uh, he's someone that to me was a prolific writer. He wrote so well. And um, so, so he did make an impact on my, my career because I used a quote out of his to help guide me when I didn't have criteria that specifically said one thing or another and you had to actually make a judgment call, then I kind of went back to this quote of his. And when, when something is right or, or not perceived to be right. And I used that um, throughout a lot of my career, certainly after reading the book, and, and so just to give you a kind of a shout out that um, this is uh, someone that certainly made an impact on everything I did on a daily basis. So I wanna start with a little bit on carbon, we'll call that the food. So when you hear carbon, think food. And the, in the Bismarck Tribune, which is our local newspaper, I just took a few excerpts out of there just in the last few weeks and so our governor wants us to be starting up on top here. Uh, he wants us to be carbon neutral by 2030. That, that's not far off. And we've already started uh, with our ethanol plants, um, harvesting the CO2 out of them. And I believe the first one started injecting CO2 into a formation uh, just rather recently. On the national scale, uh, President Biden is asking for 2050. And so that's, that's a little more lead time. So in North Dakota, our governor said we have the geological jackpot. And at first I didn't know what he was referring to, but what he's referring to is this bottom paragraph right here. And what he's referring to is that uh, the Summit Carbon Solutions uh, Pipeline would go through a number of states and potentially go to just, if you can see my cursor, just Northwest of Bismarck, about 
an hour and a half drive and they would inject it into a formation. So these are things that are in discussion, okay? And then of course we have uh, individuals like an Elon Musk uh, who wants to take the carbon dioxide and convert it to rocket fuel. So have we ever had more conversation about carbon? I, I don't know if we have. And those of you that are looking for more information, I would recommend this science note on the left. Uh, the British Society of Soil Science did a really nice job putting together information on it. And this particular document on the right side, uh, if you wanna read about the voluntary carbon credits and different companies, et cetera. So pros and cons, uh, certainly challenging. And then also the uh, northcentralwater.org, uh, the 12 universities, which I believe Wisconsin and North Dakota are both part of, uh, that, that is also an excellent source to go to to listen to some of the YouTubes that okay. have been presented. So I would give that a try also, okay. So just to let you know kind of what's happening in the Northern Plains, um, and in November, we met with the EPA. And the first day we met on WOTUS, which is uh, Waters of the US. And there was conversation on who controls what on, on our waters. And the second day was on cover crops. And the, all, the, all the different North Dakota, not all, but many of uh, the North Dakota farm organizations were present. Know, Farm Bureau, Farmers Union, Grain Growers, Corn Growers, Soybean Growers, Congressional Aids, Soil Districts, FFA. Uh, there was a lot of groups there. The interesting thing was that they all got behind cover crops and supported them. And so there's a lot of smiles here because I think we had them say, um, if I remember right, we had them say exudates. And so the, the liquid carbon exudates that come out of the root mass on a newly established cover crop. And so everybody was kind of laughing. And, uh, but it was a good day for the resource because we need to get agriculture a place at the table. So this is our newest addition at the Minokan farm. Uh, we added these brains right here in this big box and added this pole with cameras on top. So it's gonna be capturing our future soils information. Uh, we're going to start with uh, some straightforward things like soil moisture, temperature, etc., and hope to add to it in complexity as we go down the road. And then it leaves here on a fiber optics line. It can go to a local television station. It can go to wherever, wherever it leads. So kind of a thing for the future on what I think of as carbon data transfer. Then if we think of habitat, Think of the home. And so we're always looking at ways, you know, how do we bring in more habitat for, in this particular case, for native beneficial insects. And so beetle banks is uh, one that we're going to tackle uh, in 2022. So we'll put our first beetle bank in. And, uh, you know, they're, they're a habitat for predatory beetles where they can overwinter, where they can overwinter in, uh, in the native grass plants themselves at the base. And so this is, this is important. Um, we used to have a lot of single row trees that were planted in the 50s and 60s uh, in the Dakotas, but they're not there so much anymore. And so this is something that can give us a sanctuary. So this is what, um, this was my, my order that went in, uh, in, in regards to uh, wildflower forbs and in regards to native bunch grasses. Now, this is not your list. Uh, you would be looking at what's adapted in Wisconsin, which would be a little different list. But beetle banks, and then if you put it in your backyard, right here in Bismarck, uh, then we call it a bump, a beetle bump and it might just be a few plants in a bit of a circular fashion. And, uh, but it's how we build back you know, the, the system, the ecological system. And then I also use motels at the Minokan farm. 
And so here I'm just on the left side, I'm cleaning out uh, the old rooms from the previous year. And we get them a fresh start uh, in the early spring. And the different native bees uh, like to uh, go ahead and lay some eggs and then they'll put some material at the entrance to kind of plug it up. And they all use different materials, so, so interesting. And then of course we learn to manage our habitat. So managing it, things like leaving some of that residue in place in your garden even, much less your cropland. And um, we learned that this ecosystem has a lot of function. So I was walking along, this is early morning and it's cool out. And this particular snake right here crawled up the branches and he's sunning himself. And he felt that warmth and he moved toward it. And I could get ridiculously close to him before he would move because he did not want to move out of that sunlight. But when you have this, I, I don't have things like snails, et cetera, in my garden. Okay. They take care of those because you build back that ecosystem. So also this is in the high tunnel at the Minokan farm. So this was an interesting individual, our, geo, our GOP or Argeop, or I've, I've heard different pronunciations. And, and uh, I think of him as, you know, a, a garden spider. He's an orb weaver. Uh, and, and the stable amentum is so interesting. And that's this weave right down here. And, and there's a lot of conversation and discussion. You can read about a lot of uh, options about what that might be. Because I, I think we're not totally sure could have something to do with mating, could have something to do with light, it could have a number of purposes that I think we're not totally sure. So a little later in the year, take a look at it now. Now the stable momentum is a little bit uh, different location. It's the same web, but it's got a different look to it. And you can see this guy's really working hard. I couldn't tell if that was a grasshopper or a cricket or exactly what he had. I just leave them alone and I'm glad to have them. Also, if you wanna take a closer look at slugs, which some people do, I just listed these and, and you can look at those at your leisure. But if you really dislike slugs, then you wanna watch this one on the bottom, ground beetle eats a slug, because it's a slow, painful uh, death for that slug. And uh, whereas when the toad comes along, it's pretty quick. But uh, so if you really dislike slugs, uh, slughelp.com, that's for you. So garden covers, um, this is our high tunnel. Uh, as soon as we finish production, they go to a cover crop. And uh, you, can, you can churn through a soil really quickly in a high tunnel because it's uh, so hot and, and uh, it's like farming in the tropics, it's wet and hot. And, and uh, the cover crops help us build back, okay? They build back by putting the liquid carbon exudates into the soil and, and it, it builds us the soil aggregates, okay? And the first four to eight weeks of any green plant, you're looking at liquid carbon exudates. And so this is the carbon that goes directly to the microbes. Different species, um, I try to use some good diversity. This is one that um, I, I used recently. Uh, some of the driving reason I used it is because I had it. I had some of these. And then there are other times where I might have to order a bit, but it doesn't take much. I do plant it a little on the thick side, as you can see. And when I terminate it the next spring, and the next spring, it's just the cereal rye part makes it. The rest of it dies out as an annual. But the cereal rye portion I cover for 10 days, no sunlight for 10 days and then I'm ready to seed directly into it. So a little bit on cropland in covers. Um, here we got the best of both worlds. We got the dry material giving off CO2 and we got the green plant taking in CO2. So we got all of this happening right at the same time. That makes it so interesting. And I think the liquid carbon exudates are what's going into the soil with the green plant right now. So that's, that's probably one of the major items we can do 
that feeds the biology. So that liquid carbon exudate is the food source for the biology and it goes directly to the biology. So many other things have to go through a decomposition um, until we actually can show some kind of carbon increase in our soils. This one is pretty direct. This is in a field from this fall. We had a severe drought in the Dakotas in the Bismarck area the past two years. Uh, but this field looks, looks good. We had a little bit of rain in the after harvest, uh, nothing really before. Uh, but you can tell this one is just uh, cereal rye as a monoculture. Uh, it's gonna go to planting green next spring. So that field will go to soybean. For many years, hard red spring wheat was the number one crop in North Dakota. And about five, six years ago, it became soybean followed by corn and, and eventually wheat. So it's different. Uh, wheat was the higher carbon plant out of those three, out of corn, soybean, and wheat. Wheat is the higher carbon plant, so it had more food. So we need to learn to adjust that. So I showed some 60 inch corn briefly the last time we talked, but now I had the opportunity to to show you the uh, cover crop implementation into the 60 inch corn. So you can see on the left side, we're putting the covers in and that's a pretty early stage. You can still straddle it. So this is maybe D4 or five, somewhere is fairly close to that. And then on the right side, you can see it just starting to come up. Okay, so it's just coming up. Interestingly enough, um, it came up, there, there was no rainfall. So it, it's just on its own. And the, all these pictures I took in the same spot. And then you can see the emergence here. And if we go to on the left side, and if we go to the right side, uh, we can take a little walk in it. So you can design this however you feel best to meet your resource needs, okay? So I wanted to get a few more flowers in this one. And so I'll be adjusting that a little bit for 60 inch corn for this coming year and, and have a little bit more of the flowering in because then you get the insect in and get the insects, you get the birds and pretty soon you're building an ecosystem. So this was the species list that I used. You know, it's not yours. Uh, this is the one we put together to meet our needs and I'll tweak, tweak that some for next year. This is what it looks like when it actually rains. And so that's something we've been a little short on the past couple of years, hoping for a better year. And so it kind of gives you some idea, but um, wet year or dry year, when we improve soil health, we can get the water into the profile because we built soil aggregates and it allows this infiltration. So wet year or dry year, positive item. So this is our perennial. Uh, field. This was a perennial pasture. And when we took the, it's a rotational perennial. So we seeded it and it ran for five years. And then we went ahead and converted it to a, a perennial cover crop, uh, in this case for corn production. So that worked pretty effectively also and saved us the cost of uh, buying the cover. Then covers with beans and canola. Uh, we've also used uh, soybean and pinto bean, canola and flax. Uh, this is what we look like in the spring. So this rye is never going to get very tall in the Northern Plains. Uh, this is about as tall as it's going to get, typically. And it may get close to heading, uh, but it's not like my friends that send me pictures from Pennsylvania and other locations um, where the, the rye is really tall and it's like five feet or more tall and they can roll it and all those things. But this is Northern Plains, so this is us. So also we'll talk, just touch on adding biology. And uh, this is the, the high tunnel when it's in production. And so where I started to add uh, biology was in the high tunnel. And so I take the uh, vermicompost liquid extract or, or worm juice, if you're willing to call it that. But vermicompost liquid extract sounds so much more formal. 
And so we take that and I coat the seeds uh, at seeding time. So all the seeds from the carrots and the sweet potatoes and everything that gets planted, uh, I'll coat the seeds with the bioinoculant. And then I'll give it two foliar applications during the growing season. So you can see here on the bottom. And then when we send in that analysis, and this is kind of a typical analysis, but we'll send it into the molecular research DNA lab in Shallow Water, Texas. And you'll get a printout of all the DNA that's in there. And so there were 370 species on the average and a number of fungi phylum and a number of bacteria phylum. And so it's, uh, it has next to no nutrient in it. So don't think of it as a fertilizer. So I started, I started doing that and I've ran this high tunnel now for a number of years with um, the liquid extract and cover crops. Okay. And so now I'm going to something a little bit larger. And so what we're looking at doing, this, this got built um, uh, in November of just this past year. And so it's about 120 feet long, 12 feet wide. It slopes to the center. As you can see, it slopes to the center. And then it slopes from one end to this drain. So it all slopes at a 2% grade. And 2% grade on something like this, um, every four feet roughly is an inch of drop. So it's a very gentle grade, leads to this drain. Uh, from there, it'll accumulate in an insulated livestock tank with a cover on it, because I don't want any sunlight on it. And then underneath the, um, this is compost. So underneath this compost, uh, we'll put, uh, it's a tile drainage. So if you were going to build a home in Bismarck, the contractor would be installing this around your basement, okay? And so it's corrugated, it uh, has slots in it, and then there's a sock on it, okay? And so I put that underneath uh, just for aeration uh, because um, if it goes anaerobic, it, it makes alcohol. If it makes alcohol, the microbes don't make good decisions. So that, that was just a joke. So. Okay, so uh, we're, we're putting that on and uh, this will keep it aerated. Uh, next spring, I'll add the uh, worms, uh, red wigglers, European night crawlers. I'll add them. I have a 15 foot fabric cover that'll allow rain in, but it, it uh, will keep away the weed growth and those type things. And I'm hoping that that will process in the neighborhood of probably a year and a half to two years uh, during that period of time, and we'll accumulate uh, the leachate and use that as needed. I'm also, it's a little bit larger than we need, but um, I have uh, some farmer uh, clients in the area that uh, would like to take a look at it. So we'll make a little extra. Then when you're planting, this is the, um, the liquid extract from the vermicompost. And we, uh, we applied it at four gallons uh, per acre uh, onto uh, naked seed. So that was the microbes. And then we, uh, I also had a little bit of uh, molasses in it. That was the carbon. And this kind of goes back to some of you will maybe have taken Elaine Ingham's class or, or certainly know who she is. Um, she wrote the, the original soil biology primer uh, for NRCS. This is a lot of years ago. And uh, that's, that was my first uh, reading of that primer where I started to understand a little bit more because she was, she was good at illustrating what this biology was doing. And then more recently, the crop advisor, John Kemp, I want to say he's out of Pennsylvania, but it could be off the state. And then Joel Williams out of uh, Toronto um, have probably capitalized and expanded on this even more. So we start looking at nutrient management a little bit differently. And, and then we get into the microbes and the nutrient and the carbon. So that's what we're doing here. And then of course we find, um, uh, we wanna put in some nutrient in this particular case, the concentrated fish emulsion. Uh, isn't like the old days uh, where it had, it had a, a bit of an aroma. Uh, this is virtually odor-free and makes a nice product uh, in the liquid. 
And so we put it on as a foliar as well. And then you start to understand uh, why it's a lower uh, need because it doesn't have to go through the microbes. In this case, it goes directly onto the leaf. And when you have the workers, a bit of nutrient and a bit of carbon, carbon being the food, uh, that makes for an interesting scenario that is quite a bit different in nutrient management than what we probably all um, studied at one time in college or at least all learned about on our, in our daily work scenarios. So, I, so that makes kind of an interesting situation. Okay, so just to summarize, carbon's the food and it's the food for the biology. It's the currency of exchange. Uh, in the soil. And, and it helps us understand that that's kind of the fuel for the microbes, okay? And, and ultimately it's the microbes then that start to build these soil aggregates. And really the life, so much of the life in the soil centers around the soil aggregate. So if you have that scenario, now all of a sudden your infiltration is better, your gas exchange is better. Your biology distribution, because biology, much of it moves through the pore spaces. So all of a sudden, all these things kind of start to change. And we see this improvement. And then we see our soils get a little bit darker. And we start to understand that as the carbon level goes up in them, they get a little darker appearance. And so this is, this is uh, the, to me, is kind of what you want to see. You want to see these soil aggregates built on this root mass. And if you can figure out how to get that done in a consistent basis, and I say consistent basis because what you're looking at is uh, soil aggregates maybe only last a few weeks or months. You'll find different articles on it. I think they're all kind of in, in agreement that a month or two is probably a long time for a soil aggregate. And so you're always building and rebuild. And I think that, that to me would kind of summarize up in terms of the carbon and it takes the habitat, the home, uh, to make that work. And so if you have to pick one to start with, uh, if you have to, I would ask myself the question, can I live longer without food or without my home? Well, the answer to that is I can live longer without my home. I have to have food quite, quite uh, steady and quite routinely in order to be functioning. And so I always start with food if I can. So that's why a cover crop becomes really important. If it's an organic system, if it's a no-till system, a conventional tillage system, whatever that system is, if you can bring covers in it, you now can recycle nutrients. Okay. instead of them going up or down, uh, instead of wet conditions, um, uh, denitrification that typically can occur in there. Now you've got the inorganic nutrient went into a green plant and, and now you can carry it forward to the next year. So all those things start to play out and, and if you can bring cover crops into any of those systems, and I, I think there's, there's benefits to be had in, in any of them. Fortunately, in this country, we have a number of different systems. And I think that's really rather important because I think what goes forward into the future in the next 10, 20 years is probably going to be portions of these different systems that evolve. Because I think today we would be hard pressed to say that this one, this one or that one is stellar. They all have some different benefits. And thank goodness we've got different people uh, applying different systems, because I think going forward, we're probably going to need different parts of all of them. So that, that's just something I wanted to share with you. So then this is your homework. So um, if you haven't read Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold, good place to start, right? And if you enjoy reading anything about what formed your soils um, and, and the whole scenario on, on what happened with our bison in this country. Um, Frank Meyer's book is, is very good on that. My former colleague, uh, John Sticka, who wrote a soil owner's manual, he writes well and, and he has a good knack for explanations. And so you can start looking at all that. Uh, dirt to soil, one of my old 
clients. Uh, Gabe Brown lives close to the Minokan farm. Uh, you can take a look at his information. Uh, so there's a whole lot of data here. Also, our YouTube channel is called Minokan Farm. And so we have a video library on there from all of our speakers uh, coming to Bismarck or the Minokan Farm the last, I would say the last three to four years. So you'll probably find about 80, 90 videos on there. And they're all rather recent and they're all different individuals from around the country. So if you get that chance, and then our website is minokanfarm.com. So we are exactly at 30 minutes, uh, Matt, uh, just to give you a heads up. And that's where we're going to stop. And uh, because you told me what you were going to do if I didn't stop at 30 minutes. And so I'm, I'm definitely going to stop at 30 minutes. So. Uh, yeah, you're telling everybody that we threatened our keynote speaker, which is a bad look for us, but uh, we'll, we made time for a conversation, I guess we'll, we'll spend on it. Um, please uh, enter any questions you have for Jay in the chat box. I know we have one coming in that we'll get to in a minute, but uh, we have uh, 15 minutes for a conversation. Yeah. Um, Jay, thank you for your presentation. And um, I guess I wanted to take the, the moderator's privilege of asking the first question. I, I really oh, please. loved that you started off this talk talking about critters uh, and the small things and the, the biotic life that you've observed on Minokan Farm. Um, and obviously fostering life is the, the title of your talk and you said it should be our thought process. I'm, I'm curious from the perspective of a farmer or a landowner for, uh, that doesn't manage their land for biodiversity, who isn't paying attention to those small things that you're referring to. Um, and I would assume there's a lot of people that don't. Um, what's a logical first step to help them transition to this, to that mindset um, and eventually that process of, yeah. of fostering life on, on their land, be it a farm or a forest or, or whatever it is? So when, uh, when the, uh, and it's a good question, Matt. And uh, so when, when we started going down this road, looking more at rebuilding and regeneration, uh, what we really needed was a starting point, like you just mentioned. And so the starting point um, for me, and I think uh, many others, became the soil health principles. And so they were the principles that you could go through with somebody uh, on their particular field or garden or pasture or and, and it gave us a starting point. And then of those five principles, uh, I always started with armor uh, because until you stabilize um, that field, it's very difficult to achieve uh, soil regeneration, if you will. And once uh, in our environment, when we finally uh, put cover on the ground, sometime in the 90s, we moved. Uh, predominantly into no-till systems. And then we hydrate it. What we found out is all of a sudden our soils also hydrate. And, and so that was a great starting point. And so the principles were intended to be um, applied um, as a, a system or a suite of, of principle, principles, if you will. And, uh, but if you could only get one, I, I would start with armor. And, and once the principles come onto a field, it starts to change some. And then uh, myself uh, being a, an old monitor, if you will, I, uh, I would monitor those soils for infiltration, uh, for carbon, for those type things. And that's when I think it got exciting. And that's when we started to see people get on board. Uh, because those are the changes that I think most farmers are kind of looking for. And they were changes they could do themselves, manage themselves. And, and it got, I think that's when our, our neck of the woods, if you will, started to accelerate. Thank you, Jay. Um, we have a question from Haley from Trempolo County. And she asks, do you plant right into the terminated cover crop in the garden or do you pull the, the dead cover crop? Yeah, good question. And it was Haley, is that correct? Okay, that was a good question, Haley. And, and so again, the soil health principles apply in the high tunnel, in the outdoor garden, in the cropland, and in our rotational um, perennials. And so what, what we do is I, 
I uh, kill off the, in this case in the spring, the only thing that's gonna survive a North Dakota winter uh, is, is cereal rye. And so I'll smother it, take the sunlight away. And then where the uh, drip lines run, uh, I'll just take a garden trowel and, and uh, move the soil enough to put the seed in. So there's very limited uh, disturbance. And then so one of the interesting things from that has been uh, I have very little weeding. And so the, the amount of weeding in the high tunnel is just very minimal, mostly at the beginning of the year. But uh, just uh, I do the minimum amount of soil disturbance with a garden trowel. Basically, I put it in the soil and I bend it enough to open it up and put a seed. Thanks, Jay. Uh, we've got some more questions coming into the chat box and feel free to continue those if folks have them. Um, asking uh, Kathy Turner from NRTS is asking your thoughts on BRICS testing. Uh, we do BRICS testing, uh, especially with uh, more with our uh, grazing system. We started BRICS testing when we were trying to pin down the optimum time to move the yearlings and sheep. And so we move daily, usually. Uh, over the weekend, we'll give them a couple of days because nobody lives there, but so we'll give them two days. But during the week, we, we give them enough forage for a day at a time. And so when we do that, then it becomes, when should you move? Well, the, the human inclination is, you know, somebody got out there at seven or eight, we got to go move those livestock so we can do this other part. Well, that, that's something you got to get past. And so when you do the BRICS analysis, you're gonna find that the photosynthetic rate is, starts to improve and increase sometime between that 11 to one o'clock, depending on cloud cover and temperature, that type of thing. And so we, we started moving them with the higher uh, elevation of BRICS. And that usually took us into that 11 to one. So we're normally going to, so we use, that's how we started using BRICS. And then, of course, it's such a good indicator um, on virtually any crop. And now, more recently, uh, we've started taking a look at it a little bit more in terms of uh, cropland and uh, garden produce and these type of things. So first time I had the meter, uh, I found out, don't take it into the grocery store and uh, start uh, squeezing anything in there because the grocery store didn't like that. So don't, don't do that part. That's a valuable piece of, uh, of closing information. <laughs> Thanks, Jan. Um, Mitch from Sauk County has a question, kind of a follow-up to the initial question I asked, which was, how has your applications of synthetics, fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, fungicides changed yep. Yep. by learning and implementing soil health practices over your lifetime? Well, that's, that's a, a one or two day workshop uh, question, but let's, let's summarize it a bit. And so, uh, the first thing we took out at the Minokin farm were the fungicides. Because it's, uh, it's extremely difficult to expect um, anything from mycorrhizal fungi to saprophytic fungi. It's very difficult to expect them to be able to do their job uh, if you're using a fungicide. And so the first thing that went was the fungicide. Second item that we took out completely uh, was uh, insecticides. And so we took, took both of those out. And because of the same reason, we, we need the predator-prey relationship. And so those, those had to go. Now, if you take them out in a system that doesn't have diversity, uh, no crop diversity, no cover crop, no cover crop diversity, uh, maybe a full tillage system, no livestock integration, um, that's, that's gonna be a tougher road where in our scenario, we had all four crop types on the ground. Um, we had, we had uh, a no-till system, and then eventually we got the cover crops. Once we got the cover crops, we had the livestock integration. And regarding the fungicide and insecticide, never looked back. And so we took out, um, we never did use, um, we just had one field that we used commercial fertilizer on at the Monokan farm, the other nine do not. And so while I was never able to match the yield on the fully fertilized field, I, I was able to improve over it on net income. And so that's, that's a whole big topic on nutrient management. 
And when I look at nutrient management uh, within NRCS, I don't feel that that standard is wrong, but I do feel today that it is a bit incomplete. And so it's almost like we need two standards because there's a lot of people that still use that standard. And so we probably still need that standard, but I think we also need to be looking at rewriting a standard that brings more of the biological component to play and would give, would give our clients a, a starting point. But that's a big question. I'm, I'm gonna keep it fairly short in the interest of other people asking uh, questions as well, but I would say that question is a two-day workshop, maybe a master thesis. Thanks, I think you did a good job summarizing, uh, condensing that all. Um, I, I did wanna ask a, a follow-up question. Uh, we'll get to Zach's in one moment, but curious, how, how would you prioritize um, spending or where would you prioritize spending on, on a farm budget? Well, if, uh, everyone's got one, right? Everyone's got a farm budget. And if you don't have a farm budget, you've got a work budget of some type. When, when at the Minokan farm, if we, have, if we have an extra dollar or two in the budget, I like to spend it on a green plant. And, and so typically it's gonna to go toward a cover crop or it's gonna to go toward a cash crop diversity. And so plants fix these soils. And, and so I, I, want, I want the plant and at its early stages, it gives off the liquid carbon exudate at its later stages that reverses the plant physiology. It reverses, it goes toward grain production. But initially, uh, we get the exudates, and the exudates are such a big item to me, and it's where I think we've seen our primary gains in terms of actually carbon um, going into the, directly into the soil. So, green plant. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Zach from Fond du Lac County. Uh, a farmer recently said to me he wasn't happy with cereal rise growth in the fall. Spring growth is great. Um, what would be a good companion cover crop to plant with rye after silage harvest that has fast emergence? Winter kill would be fine. Yeah, I, I like to use I like to use the combinations uh, because I find them stronger, and I find them capable of addressing more uh, resource concerns simultaneously. And so, in the fall, uh, my first question would be something that I haven't been able to use here. Uh, and that is Austrian winter pea. And I don't know how it would do in your climate. I don't know if it would winter kill out here. It looks great in the fall, but not so much in the spring. So we've used uh, with, with uh, rye or triticale, either one. Uh, we've used uh, vetch, uh, we've used the brassicas. I've used what I call Northern field pea or a forage pea, uh, it's an annual but it does really good uh, in, in the fall. It, it, it's not opposed to some cool temperatures at all. In fact, that's kind of its preference. So I'd probably try to get um, a forage pea in with it. And I think you're gonna find uh, maybe a little hardier looking. I never fertilize my cover crops because they are out there to scavenge any of the uh, inorganic nutrient and, and uh, preserve it and carry it over so I can recycle it and it doesn't have to leave that field. So I, I never do that. All, all of these plants are good scavengers, basically. Uh, so I think any of those type diversities are something that's kind of worked in our neck of the woods. You know, your, your neck of the woods is different, but um, you, can, you can certainly take a look at pea. Thanks, Jay. Um, we only have, I uh, guess we have time for a couple or we have two more minutes here and I see that Bob McKeel just raised his hand. So we're gonna let Bob's question close us out here. Oh, no pressure. Thanks. No pressure, Bob, Thanks, better hit a home run. <laughs> <laughs> so Jay, I'm curious, and we've talked about this uh, prior, um, your travels over the course of six years, taking you to different states, provinces and countries. What is, you know, under the conservation eye, what are the challenges that farmers are facing across the yeah. board and what is maybe the common denominator with all? Yeah, so, so uh, you can read a lot of the old documents, uh, the 7,000 year document and, and all those different ones, and they have very similar uh, resource concerns, and I'll just list a few. So, so wind erosion, 
and it's still with us. It's 2022, and, and it's, it's difficult to control. So when you have wind erosion, you have phosphorus transport, and we lose a lot of our phosphorus that way. And so whatever we can do to stabilize wind erosion. Water erosion is behind it, uh, depending on where um, in the U.S. you're farming. And uh, so water erosion is certainly on the table, transports a lot of nutrient out. It's not just soil. It's never just one item. Uh, then salinity. If you're an area like the Northern Plains, we were underwater um, uh, geologically for a long time. And so we have geological salts. And if we are using uh, trans transpiration, we're fine. But if we're using evaporation, not so much. And then the common denominator, I think is, I've seen wherever um, you go has been carbon deficient soils. And uh, if you can compare them to a nearby forest or a nearby grasslands in our case, uh, then you really realize how carbon deficient they are. They normally have about half of the amount of carbon. Here in North Dakota, I've done this a number of times uh, where I was out at a farm. I took, took a standard soil test, which is gonna have your soil organic matter on it. And I would grab one uh, in the grasslands as well, if, if they were a mixed operation. We were usually in the cropland less than half. And so carbon deficient soils, big common denominator. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jay. Um, in the interest of keeping us on schedule here, uh, we're going to wrap up the yep. keynote session, um, but really appreciate your enlightening opening uh, conversation. And we have an opportunity to hear more from Jay at our next session um, at 1115 that builds off of one of his answers about the first soil health principle to start with, um, armor up.